HPE is a sponsor of our coverage from OpenStack in Barcelona. Learn more about HPE Helium, the hybrid cloud, and what it all means for the enterprise customer at hpe.com. Learn more again at hpe.com. Okay, hey, it's Alex Williams of the New Stack here at OpenStack Barcelona. Now with Tom Norton of HPE. Hey, Tom. Hi, Alex. So, Tom, tell us about you know, yourself and what you do at HPE. Well, I'm responsible for our cloud services overall. So I've got a team of teams of consultants around the world who, um, who specialize in integration, consulting, integration, and deployment services for cloud platforms, cloud integration, anything cloud native as well. Okay. Okay, so so we hear a lot about uh, Docker, and you guys have a partnership with Docker. We hear a lot about Mesos, you know, Mesos, and we, you have a partnership. You, know, you have an investment in a Mesosphere, right? And uh, I'm curious about local adoption rates for these type of technologies and local adoption for microservices. How are you seeing that? Ha what's happening out there? Well, I think there's a a progression into containers and microservices now. So. From, a, from the perspective of how they're adopting Docker and others, I think Docker as a container on top of another platform is where we see it most often. Oh really, so tell us about what that would mean. So it would mean like if you wanted to, instead of putting a building a virtual machine and you want to deploy an application in a virtual machine to a virtualized environment, what we see now is people packaging those applications in a container. Um, adding that container to some type of container registry so they could use the application in various different environments, whether it be a VMware environment, a Microsoft environment, a Rackspace kind of cloud environment. So I think the first step is just re-platforming or refactoring applications so they can be portable. So are they moving those containers a lot often into their into virtual machines then? Um, well, it may reside. I think it's one of the first elements is to move the, the, the application and contain the application in a container like Docker. I don't know if it means a change. I don't know if people are porting yeah. off virtual machines into containers. They may be developing for a container like Docker. Okay, on a virtualized um, infrastructure. Right. So right. we see that movement now. I think what's happening, though, is more of an understanding of containers overall for customers. Customers want to know how they can apply Kubernetes as, a, as an orchestration engine for containers, how they could apply Docker on top of OpenStack, for example. So you could provision an environment, you could build a cloud environment, and then use the, the workloads and have that distributed ver through a, a version like Docker. So take us around the world a little bit, and where, you, you know, like, so for example, in Europe, and for example, what is the adoption rates and compared to Asia and other parts of the world? Oh, it's interesting. So I think from, a, from an uptake, it's happening all over. I think that we see a lot of adoption in, in advanced countries or countries who are, do, have been used to for technologies like Docker and working in the open um, class of technologies like OpenStack. Um, so places like Japan, there's a high uptake around OpenStack. And now we see more of a willingness then to start combining things. Like you combine, I mentioned before, OpenStack with a container technology on top of it. Right. Um, supporting a container orchestration engine with Docker doing, or OpenStack doing bare metal provisioning, for example. So people are blending technologies together. But adoption is universal. I think what's interesting is adoption by industry. So initially we saw a lot of uptake in telcos, for example. So telecoms were doing a lot of work initially in trying to adopt open cloud and containers. But now we see why? financial services going. Why, why telcos? Well, well, I think telcos were trying to expand beyond what they traditionally had as a service offering. So they were maybe they were a fixed line telco with, with global uh, mobile services. And the margins are shrinking so much in those, in those particular service offerings from telcos that they really wanted to move into something else which could provide them higher margins for their customers. So they started moving into a public cloud space or a managed service provider space where they could work with their partners and give them more than just communication lines, they could give them infrastructure. They could give them a development platform. They could give them network, function network virtualization like SDN or NFE. So containers are part of that route to getting those higher margins because they can isolate applications and services and then offer those as back to their end customers? Well, I think what they can do for their end customers is they can actually make that application portable. So they'll, so the service provider, the telco, will use containers 
as a distribution method so that you, they could, in essence, move the application more quickly and readily between an on-premise environment that the customer right. may have and the customer could move the application in a portable way to the telco. So the telco could be a burster, for example, to support the application. They'll use containers to be able then to, to move that application maybe to an edge if they had a, a remote data center or even for, a, say, a, a retail organization. They could move it from a store to, um, to a telco who would be a public cloud service provider to on-premise and you could, you could actually support the distribution of the application, the distribution of data, and make it more portable in the, in the hybrid ecosystem, which is more of a hybrid IT approach. And that was previously done through, you know, moving virtual machines around, which were a much bigger load and everything else that goes with that. It's a, it's a bigger load, it's more expensive, it's, yeah. it's got a higher overhead in terms of supporting that. Right. I think the redundancy aspect of it and the portability between different environments is more difficult right. to support. Um, I think it's always been the way we've done it in the past. Now, if you start thinking about IoT and, and edge compute, um, containers is really creating a, a big differentiator there because you can do things by running the application in, on the edge in, in the remote data center or in the store, and you could process something there within that container environment with the, with the infrastructure that's there without having to move that workload back to the, to the data center, which may be expensive to move. Yeah. You have te telecommunication costs associated with it. You have data center footprints. So you slow down. Say you're going to do a, an analytical model. You have a data model that you've created for a store assessment of sales for that day. Moving all that data from the stores to be able to centralize it and then run a query against it is expensive. But if you can, if you can contain that analytical model within the store and just move the results back to the data center for a larger processing, you create efficiencies, you create cost reductions, um, you prevent the data center from um, from expanding beyond its ability to support the infrastructure. So it creates a lot of advantages by using a combination of containers from for portability of workloads but also centralized processing. So containers is going to change that game a little bit too in, in, in terms of how you build the infrastructure. So financial services you're saying are moving, are starting to pick it up too. Yeah, so I would say a couple things. Financial services is really looking at Cloud Foundry with containers to be able to build applications and deploy applications. So what's happening in financial services is maybe in mortgage systems, in, um, in wealth management, in insurance, all these are for the traditional banks are very competitive markets. But you, I mean, you can see today something like a Quicken Loans and Rocket, what they announced at the Super Bowl last year. That kind of changed the games for mortgage companies now. So if you are a traditional bank with mortgage, now you have to produce what you would produce in two days, you have to produce in an hour or in two hours. You have to change the game in terms of your mobile application so that it's more robust. It provides more integration of services. So if you can build a mobile application which can take advantage of microservices, which could be deployed to you on containers. And you can capture information coming from, you know, you have, you have different financial companies, you have people reporting against FICO, for example, you have different type of, of reporting against, even from traffic patterns, accidents, things like that happening in different metro areas. You can change how you build insurance policies, you can change how you, how you evaluate mortgages in a much more robust way, but also in a faster way than you could do before. So you can do that with, the container, so the container technology, container approach allows you basically to, to create these microservices architectures. Essentially, I just think that they can then share them, you know, share and you know, and right. replace or whatever it might be. Yeah. So if you're building an application, you can think you might have historically we've done it in a waterfall way, but now we can say I need information from the National Weather Service or I need information from the, the city of Minneapolis. Um, I need information that's coming from some other data source or a, a component of an application that comes from a partner developer. The way you can build apps today is you just start adding these microservices into your application um, configuration and then and you can build a pod of clusters which are part of a pod of microservices and then you can actually build the app on a cluster which is made of components of pods, which are made up of components of, of containers coming from microservices. So it gives you much more flexibility, much more speed in terms of building the app. So I think financial services is competitive in terms of speed now and comp competition in the market. So they need to have a faster, 
feed system coming from partners, in fact, a, a consumption model of containers coming from partners. And if you can build it so that it's open enough, so that that container will work either with other microservices coming with other container systems, or you can have an orchestration engine below it like Kubernetes, that's what we see happening in financial services because they have to compete with an open market. But we also know it has to be open. So Staccato gives you the ability, or a, um, a PaaS system gives you the ability to work with, through open APIs, a number of different container platforms that you can develop against on top of that PaaS. So they can start working on becoming more software oriented. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So banks actually will work more towards the value of the inf information they provide, right. as opposed to, which is like wealth management or insurance. Their success is going to depend on their ability to provide the most accurate information in the most timely way. So the only way they can do that is having a system open enough where you can accept the microservices from microservices from multiple suppliers. And to do that, you have to have a contained way to provide it. And virtual machines just isn't going to handle it anymore because it could be a data model in a container. It could be a sub piece of an application in a container. All those component pieces have to be combined together and then run for a unique result. And financial services needs to do that very quickly. So the complexity that comes with this is enormous and there's still very few people who know how to actually, you know, build out containers just in Know, know how how to package, you know, applications with containers, right. but necessarily, but but even the next step, trying to build out microservices architectures and thinking about the orchestration and the storage and the networking requirements to go that right. are is really kind of the you know a domain of not a, you know, a very small group of people still. Right. So, how do you know how do you work with these companies to help them, you know, to adopt these technologies? Well, so what we're trying, what we do today is we'll work in patterns. So I, I know that, you know, I'll, I'll have some early adopter customers. We always do. And we see in that industry what those early adopter customers look like. What are, what are their particular needs? You know, are they working with multi-cloud management systems? So do you bring in someone like Scalar or RightScale or someone like that that can give you cross-platform management, even from a supplier perspective of, of microservices? And then you start working with the kind of tool chains for DevOps. You know, how good are they at Jenkins? You know, how, how good are they at Git, with GitHub? And how do they how do they manage that development lifecycle? Because that has to change. So we've developed skills and experience over time of, of how to blend the requirements of a of a high scale DevOps environment with with the management across multiple suppliers of services. So we tried to combine those. And for us, it's just come through rapid experience in the enterprise because it's difficult there's no it's very hard for a company to know because there are five or, or six different container technologies that exist today so how do you know which container technologies apply to where when do you apply something like kubernetes versus something like docker versus like we talked about mesosphere in the beginning mesos as a container versus mesosphere as a as kind of a container os or um, you look at Docker versus Docker Swarm or Docker Data Center. How do you how do you look at those different technologies? So we we've, we've been fortunate enough. That we've hired some very deep um, services people who are very deep in the OpenStack technology, and now have become very deep in some of the extensions to that, which is cloud native, which is cloud foundry, which is now moving into containers and how you blend them or integrate them to give the right solution. So I think customers have to expect that they're going to work early on now and look to, to partners or vendors or solution providers, systems integrators, um, and how they can find the right mix of those partner products, the right mix of contributors for microservices. It's going to give them the most robust system. And so what we assume today is people are pretty good at the infrastructure side. OpenStack now is pretty given in the enterprise. What customers need help on is how to move workloads to OpenStack and then how to blend microservices or containers with OpenStack to give them a complete cloud um, service delivery model. Are you being agnostic then about the distro for OpenStack then? We're running into that. Obviously, we, most of our work has been on Helium OpenStack. Right. But we have worked with partners. I've got a, um, like a mobile provider in the US that's based on, on Red Hat OpenStack. And we do a lot of work with them based on Red Hat OpenStack because of our experience in telcos and our experience in mobile providers. So um, we've done some work in open. So we've got some partners in healthcare in the US that wanted, not their own distro, but wanted to stay close to OpenStack as a community distribution. And so we've helped them, and then now they're moving away from that community to a more controlled environment like Helium OpenStack. So, you know, 
you're backing up to what I was asking originally, so considering like telcos and financial services and their yeah. interest in OpenStack, so then are you seeing then the initial then interest, you know, globally in those more industrialized countries that have more sophisticated, you know, financial services uh, Maybe. markets? Maybe. What's, inter what's interesting about it is that it's a little bit of both. So there's a lot of adoption, say, in the U.S. and um, in you know, if I looked to Europe, it's all over. So Germany, Italy, Spain, um, the UK, we do a lot of work in Ireland. So I think the early adopter was going to be in the US in kind of the continent of Europe with UKI and in a big, in big kind of technology country like Japan. But that's changing now. I mean, we've got, it's no longer just Japan, Singapore, Korea, and South Pak. There's, there's interest now in kind of leapfrogging virtualization and going right to um, open cloud platforms and ah. containers. So people are kind of leaping away from virtual machines and saying, what's my advantage? So we're doing a lot of work now in Thailand and Malaysia, the Philippines. I'm even doing work in Burma, not Burma, I'm sorry, in Miramar, um, Bhutan. Those kind of emerging countries who are, um, who are trying to establish themselves as a service provider to kind of accelerate the development of, of their, their, their companies and the services their companies can, can provide to the country of Bhutan or the, or the country of Sri Lanka or the country of Nepal. So those are really interesting because those are true hybrids where you may have a telco that starts in Singapore, um, but, but that telco is trying to emerge in Miramar or in Nepal or um, in Bhutan. And so they're going to partner with a local carrier in those countries and then accelerate the ability to support applications, um, the ability to support scalable storage in those countries. So we're seeing just a rapid rise there, but they're pulling from established countries and they're partnering with them to create their acceleration of container use and, and open cloud technologies to give them an advantage within their country and then any of the smaller countries around them. So your strategy is what exactly then, you know, as you start to see the emergence of, you know, new markets and you know, new geographic, new, new industry markets and new geographic markets start to adopt right. microservices and container architectures. Yeah. So well, it's we have to be very conscious of the local partners in those countries because it's virtually impossible for HPE to have in 110 different countries that our product base may service. It's impossible for me to have services people in each of those countries. So we work towards a much more of a more enabling a partner model. So I may work directly with partners in Singapore or in, or in Japan, for example. Um, but if, I, if I'm working in the, in the Philippines, for example, I'll partner with a, with a local services partner, a local technology partner, so we teach them we show them best practices, we will add a member to their team, kind of walk them through that their first experience in how to do the integration of these open, te open technologies in the Philippines. Um, and then we will then support, have them support the, the base infrastructure deployments. And then we'll come in and work more on the integration elements of, of high end. If I want to introduce Ceph and an OpenStack statement, if I want to introduce Scalar, if I want to do something um, from an from a app, de app development perspective, cloud native, where we'll introduce the more complex integration and the more complex technology approaches that we kind of ease in to the local partners so they pick up the OpenStack technology base. They supply infrastructure as a service and then I extend what they can do through more complex technologies, through a more centralized team in the region or even a global team. Hmm. So just in conclusion, what are you know, some of your thoughts for 2017? I, well, I think it's, a, it's, it's an extension of, of that rapid change that we see today. Right. Everybody talks about CI/CD and um, and how how you have to develop in a in a constant kind of um, integration, constant development way. But the the evolution that we see of these open technologies and of containers today is changing every month, every three months, every six months. So I really see a more um, the extent, the expansion of what we've done from a from an open cloud perspective, and really that focus, as you and I talked about, focus on on cloud native application development and how containers supports that. A, a much stronger interest in how we can extend what they do with DevOps traditionally and what they have to do in DevOps today to create a much more agile development environment and how that blends in with OpenStack. Containers is becoming much more prominent, but um, it doesn't necessarily today 
push out the kind of bare metal provisioning that you can get, the cloud management as a control plane, that's not being pushed out yet. So cloud, OpenStack and cloud platforms are still extremely important, even, even in 2017. But we're going to see the emergence much more of Kubernetes and, and Mesosphere and even Magnum as an OpenStack container technology right. as being much more prominent. But for me, I see that aligned to cloud native. I see that aligned to application portability. I see that more aligned to the, to the migration of applications and workloads to the open cloud environment. That's why that's becoming more important today. That's a real good, that's a business story. Right, and yeah. that's important for people yeah, to understand. Yeah, that's a business story. To compete, they have to do it, and, and we're seeing that migration today. They, you know, and that's, that, seems, that, will, that seems to be what's been the missing driver, for me at least, and a lot of the angst about why is enterprise so slow. It's like, there needs to be business drivers. For right, it. and, it's a, and there's, what's, what's really interesting is we always talked about assessing the applications for a large-scale application migration, taking your portfolio of 2,000 apps and moving that to a cloud. But it, it isn't unfolding that way. What's yeah. unfolding is I need to build a new app. Because yeah. a new app is competitive, so I may, I, they're starting with building new apps and then moving forward. Well, great. Well, uh, well Tom, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to talk. Appreciate it. Um, Look forward to following up with you guys and seeing where this all takes you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, Alex. It's nice Great. talking to you. Thanks. Thank you. HPE is a sponsor of our coverage from OpenStack in Barcelona. Learn more about HPE Healy and the hybrid cloud and what it all means for the enterprise customer at hpe.com. Learn more again at hpe.com.